So Tom, you are back into founder land at the moment um, with your new company, Maptio. Um, could you tell us a bit about what Maptio is and, and how it came about? Yeah, sure. So the problem that we're trying to solve with Maptio really starts with uh, companies and other organizations when they hit this growing pain anywhere between about six or 12 people and they suddenly realize that the very informal way of organizing that served them well when they were very very small suddenly starts to creak at the seams and it's difficult to get everybody in the same room together it's difficult for people to keep track of who's responsible for what um, and the organization starts to become to feel a little bit more complex and unless people know otherwise that's the point where it's really easy for an organization to sleepwalk into becoming a management bureaucracy because someone will say well clearly we need managers and we need some departments and we need to create some silos um, and that can certainly help to create more control inside the organization but um, I'm sure listeners of this podcast will be very well aware of some of the downsides of um, of management hierarchy. So the question is, is if you're not going to do the traditional management hierarchy thing, what's the alternative? And people often look at some of the inspiring examples out there, like some of the examples in Fred Laloux's book, Reinventing Organizations. They might look at Spotify or, or Netflix or, or WL Gore and try and copy some of their ideas. But they find that in reality, it's not that easy to copy what somebody else has been doing for many, many years and make it work for yourself. Um, and into that mix, you've got these new organizational operating systems like Holacracy, which are, provide a really good alternative to management hierarchies. But then what we're starting to see more and more is people just find them overbearing with too many rules. It's complicated in a different way um, and they get a bit stuck. So the idea behind Maptio is to um, focus on not so much the organization, but focus on What's the creative idea that all of this organization stuff is trying to realize? Um, so starting off by drawing a circle and saying this represents the overall vision of the initiative. And then within that, there are some smaller circles that represent some smaller ideas that contribute to the big vision. And building up what we call an initiative map to just get clear on how the big vision breaks down into its smaller parts and who's responsible for what along the way. Um, it has a few more features which we can talk about in a bit, but that's the, that's the core idea, to help people find a way of organising without traditional management hierarchy, but without the overbearing rules of something like Holacracy, by focusing on mapping the creative initiative that's underneath it all. I know you've worked a lot with, um, with self-managing organisations um, and in your kind of consultancy work and as a, uh, previously as a founder of your own company as well. What were some of the um, frustrations and some of the pitfalls that you uh, experienced or um, witnessed that um, inspired Maptio? Mm. So one of them is a phenomenon that I call creative entropy. Um, and this is something that you see all the time if you look at um, very self-managed, very autonomous companies where there's lots of freedom for people to start new initiatives, do new things. And what often happens is that these companies very naturally attract creative, self-starting people. It's a good environment for people like that to be. Um, and it's very easy for those people to start new projects and initiatives inside the company. And what you start to see over time is that the company gets more and more bloated as more people start more initiatives. But at the same time, it's a lot harder to shut down an initiative just because it may be pushes the boundary of the organization a little bit a little bit wider. It's harder to say to someone to stop doing something than it is to get support to start something. So it means that over a period of time, things start to get really diluted and watered down. Um, and that's the this, this entropy effect, that they start doing more and more different things. And then there can be a fallout from that. The organization can become very unclear, very un, unfocused, um, people don't really know what this the, the whole represents anymore. And it can cause frustration to whoever it was who started this thing in the first place when they see that the purpose isn't actually being realized. And when you have a problem at that kind of level, everyone feels its effects. You feel the energy starting to drain out of it. So that's kind of one key problem. 
and now that you're um now that you're a founder yourself um uh, are you sort of um eating your own dog food with Matteo like what, how are you um making decisions about how you work uh, and and how you interact with people um such that you kind of avoid things like creative entropy and and so on yeah it's a very you know what it's a very humbling thing to go back into founder mode from being a consultant it's so nice and easy being a consultant because you just wander into other people's initiatives and give them your thoughts on it but you haven't really got anything at, at stake ultimately and you can give your give your advice and then they take it they take it or leave it um, whereas when you're a founder you know you've really you're in a much more vulnerable position because you started something because you've got some kind of unmet need and an idea that you desperately want to to bring into the world and like you say you have to have to eat your own dog food and that's a lot harder so it's definitely a humbling experience and I'm by no means um, perfect but one of the things that I'm really trying to do now I'm back into founder mode is is really um, delicately play this role of the person who's responsible for the overall vision and that doesn't mean that I'm this old-fashioned uh, command and control dictator where I just believe that I have all the best ideas and everyone should wait for the commandments to come down from my enlightened brain up on, up on high because that's just not how, how things work. But likewise, I don't want to descend into, well, what does everybody think? And, um, and death by consensus and watering down the vision to the lowest common denominator so that everyone is kind of okay with it, but maybe it loses some of the um, some of the edginess to it. And making sure that I take responsibility for the vision, but also the number one job that I have to do is, is listening. And this is what I always tell founders that, that I advise is that your job is to you know really take responsibility but listen 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 because there's information coming to you from all kinds of different sources especially from your from your colleagues and to create a space where people can share their ideas contribute towards things um, so that the vision gets better but making sure that you still take responsibility as an individual for holding the space for that to happen so that's one key part of the role. And then another key part is really giving the people the space and the autonomy to step up and take responsibility for parts of the vision that they feel they've got a vision for. Um, so my co-founder on Matteo, Sophia, um, is, the is the technical partner in it. And she is 100% holding the vision for everything technical. She's making the, the calls about which technologies we're using, how the software development process works, and that is 100% hers. And so within that bit of it, I'm best off just leaving her to it, making sure that she stays connected to the overall vision of Maptio. But within her part, she's the creative source for that and allowing her to um, find the best way and to, and to hold a space for the technology to be developed. Um, and then I think finally, just trying to just live the basic human values of being respectful and dignified, um, of listening to of listening to one another and caring about one another, um, such that we can create a level of trust within the team, so we can have difficult conversations and conflict when that needs to happen, and that no one's no one's hiding and people's voices can be heard. But, um, but yeah, it's so much easier to talk about this stuff than to live it in practice sometimes. So, um, yeah, I'm doing my best. And I know that because um, you sort of touch on, on you mentioned the word source. And I know this is something that you've blogged about a lot. And I think it's something that um, people, you know, fans of Frederick Leloux's uh, Reinventing Organisations and fans of Teal seem to have an allergy sometimes to this idea that someone is the source for something, that someone has a vision um, and that other people uh, are kind of um, in service of helping that people realize, uh, help, helping that person realize their vision. Mm. How do you see that kind of paradox? Um, and and what would you say to people who um, kind of get a bit scared about that idea and think, well, hang on a minute, that sounds awf an awful lot like hierarchy and the things that we're trying to move away from? Yeah, exactly. And um, and maybe the starting point is that word hierarchy, because that's a very evocative word to people these days. And almost every week I see someone share an article that says we have to destroy hierarchies and break down the hierarchies. Hierarchies are bad and evil and they must, they must end. Um, but what people need to understand is that a hierarchy is just a pattern. 
it's just a naturally occurring pattern in that you see in nature. You look at a, a tree, and that's a hierarchical pattern of a trunk and then branches and twigs and, li- and leaves. So there's nothing to be afraid of inherently about hierarchies. People are naturally wary of them because we've seen hierarchies really been being abused. So we see very toxic management hierarchies of bosses behaving in ways that really dehumanize um, people. But the important thing is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The problem is not the hierarchy. The problem is the behavior that's going on. Um, And so I find the most useful way to use the hierarchical pattern is to think of, as we're doing in Maptio, to think of the hierarchy of a big overall idea breaking down into ever smaller ideas. That's still a, a hierarchical pattern. But the important thing is, is that at every um, point in that hierarchy, starting right from the, the root node of it, there is an individual. There's one person who is, has a connection to that part of the vision that's unlike anybody else. And I know that lots of people will, will recoil from that idea, probably because it still reminds them of this, this old-fashioned command and control. But it's really important to make the distinction that this is not about power over people. This is a creative form of authority. So it's authority as in authorship. It's a creative, it's a creative role. And yeah, in a dialogue with Fred Laloon that I had, you know, he he said that he he sees it, I think you mentioned the word actually, he sees it as an allergy almost that, that some people have about thinking that anybody has a special role. Um, and actually there is a great power and a leveling up almost to be okay with that idea again. So it's it's okay to accept that somebody is the author of a particular vision or a part of a of a vision and for whoever that author is to really step into that role and take responsibility for their for their vision and for other people to to try and connect to it you know in a loving and empathic way and understand what is it that you're trying to create and what's the need that you have that's driving that's driving you um, and then when people can do can do that you can work with hierarchy quite comf- quite comfortably um, we actually managed to to get a little footnote in the second edition of, of reinventing organizations about this so about the role of the ceo or the founder in self managing companies that their role is certainly about facil- facilitating a process of coming up with the the vision but it is more than that it's accepting responsibility for the whole um, and that involves a lot of listening but it does involve authority and that's not a thing to be afraid of it seems like, uh, I mean, there, obviously there are tools like, um, you know, Mapdio is a tool, for example, that that helps bring clarity, I, I think, to um, who is doing what and what the vision is for, for each initiative and, and the kind of organization as a whole. But you've mentioned also a lot of words like you've mentioned the importance of listening uh, as a founder or a CEO, and you've mentioned words like caring, empathetic, mm. you know, loving even. Um, so it seems like there are there's a, there's something about um, soft skills as well, and something about um, your way of being that makes uh, that means that you avoid the toxic hierarchy, as as you mentioned, and create something instead that's much more um, healthy, if you like. What what would you say are um, key aspects of that? Like how how do how do leaders need to be in a different way? Um, in order to create healthy hierarchies or healthy organizations? Yeah, well, the, the almost awkward thing about this is, is that in any initiative that you, that you encounter from a company to a, a very postmodern, very decentralized um, organization, you will always find if you examine it really carefully that there is one person who has a different relationship to everybody else, the first person who took the first step to start realizing whatever the idea is. And what you find is that person's personality and their their values, and by values I mean their real values, the things that they actually express through their their words and actions, not their stated values on their their website. They become endemic in the initiative. And you and if that person has quite toxic values and behaviors, you'll see that you'll see that everywhere. So there's nobody in a company or initiative where it's more important for them to go on a journey of personal development, um, of understanding themselves, of dealing with their their shadows and their bad habits, and you know whatever else it is that might get in the way of them being truly creative or being a a good person that other creative people will want to be drawn to. 
um, they need to yeah uncover themselves and work through whatever their shit happens to happens to be because you're going to get it whether you like it whether you like it or not um, and the most powerful place to start I've found is is looking at identities so who is it that I want to be and who is it that I'm afraid to be um, and you often find that people carry stories often from their from their past uh, and it usually comes from child from childhood you know Philip Larkin was right that it's our it's our mum and dad <laughs> that um, that fucks us up <laughs> um but uncovering yeah what is it what is the story that I tell about myself who do I want who do I want to be and who am I afraid to be and exploring those stories and coming to terms with who you really are that's I found the most powerful place to to start and and for you, you know, what were what have been some of the um, practices or personal development, uh, you know, courses or um, you know sources of inspiration that have um, moved you forward in in your journey of of personal uh, development and and discovering what kind of person and leader you want to be? Yeah, sure. So I could, I could give you three actually, and um, and I would also heavily caveat this with. I'm a work in progress. I don't um, sit here saying I'm the finished article and I've got this all worked out, you know. And, and if I did believe I was, then that would probably be proof that I really wasn't. Um, but 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 three things that are helping me on on my on my journey. Um, number number one, and I see this as almost the foundation to everything, is mindfulness. And mindfulness is becoming very popular and buzzy right now. And I've been lucky enough to work with some really great teachers in recent in recent years but learning to be in the present moment um, learning about your attention learning about uh, judgment you know thinking really deeply about just the interconnected nature of reality is is so powerful and for me absolutely foundational to becoming a better person and I think I'm probably two percent along in my journey in that but but that 2% already has been quite transformative for me. And so I'd recommend people just get started with mindfulness. And it's easy to get into. You know, most people have heard of the Headspace app for a phone. And that's a really popular way of starting. Um, and that will get that will get you into it. And that's the most foundational thing, I think. And then I'd say number, number two is learning about empathy and how empathy really works. And the you know, most people have a general idea of what empathy is. You know, they know it's something to do with understanding how other people feel or standing in their shoes. But the big, the big breakthrough for me came when I learned about nonviolent communication, which is a specific way of thinking about empathy. And this idea that empathy is not just about your feelings or somebody else's feelings and connecting to that, but it's also connecting to your needs. So what's underneath that, that feeling? Um, so if somebody is is feeling angry, actually what's underneath that might be an unmet need for safety or an unmet need for respect. And so working with needs, I think, again, is incredibly powerful and incredibly important. And it's a question I love, just love to ask all the time, just say, what do you need? Let's talk about our needs. Um, and that helps us to connect to one another. I also really recommend... Um, Brene Brown's work on on this she did that very popular TED talk I think one of the most popular of all time TED talks so hopefully lots of people have um, already watched it about the power of vulnerability um, that's incredibly powerful as well um, and then the third piece is learning about identity which we touched on earlier and specifically looking at the relationship between identity and, and money um, because often this is where problems in our life show up because, you know, how many people listening have ever felt guilty, frustrated, jealous, or even sick when money has somehow entered the picture? I would guess every, everybody. But money in itself doesn't have the power to do those things to us. It's the story that we um, project onto money that has that, that has that power. And actually the stories we project onto money, that money is security, for example, if you see someone who says money is security, what you'll find is someone who wants to be secure and is maybe afraid to be insecure. And that's the thing that they need to work on, to be able to feel secure as they are with and without money and to be okay with 
with um, being insecure as well. So learning about identity, using money as a fun and interesting way into it as well as being transformative. So yeah, yeah, those three things have given me a good grounding. And um, yeah, and the plan is to, de- to deepen those. It's like I say, a work in progress. So mindfulness, empathy, um, and kind of exploring uh, needs in particular, and uh, identity, and, and looking at money as a lens through which to explore that. Yeah, exactly. I think um, one of the things I really like about Matteo and about um, your work and your approach to things that I've been following, and you know, you and I have been talking about for a few years now, is um, there's something about your approach that makes work more human again um and and i think one of the things that challenges me about holacracy is that brian robertson has even said you know it's you take the it's, you take the people out of the work and you're just you know even in meetings sometimes you might start referring to each other by your role names instead of your actual names um oh, and I, I, didn't I, I didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that so that for me, um, I had a real response to that where I thought, well, no, I think work needs to be more human, not less human. Um, mm. So I like the fact that Mapteo, um, you know, that it's about mapping, you know, initiative mapping is about you you use people's names and you talk about, um, you kind of start to tell the story of that idea and where it came from and what that person's need is and what help they need and things like that. And there's something very adult to adult and um I don't know evolved without sounding a bit pretentious about having those kind of transparent conversations yeah I mean I really I really agree gosh didn't realize holacracy was was quite that bad I mean I know I'm not not its biggest fan although I do have a lot of respect for for the, for the people at, at holacracy and the people using it um but yeah, I think what happens is people get very caught up in thinking about organisations, like the organisation is the important is the important thing, and people talk about what is the purpose of the organisation, you know, and even take it to the extreme of saying that the organisation is it's like it's its own an entity in and of itself. It's got its own soul and a purpose and a destiny of its own, and the job of the people is to steward this thing um, to go. In whatever direction it it wants to go, um, but but what often happens in reality is that really people just project their own needs, their own ideas onto the organisation. Um, so someone say, I really think that you know where this organisation wants to go is is over here, whereas what they're really saying is what I'm personally really energised to do is go over here, and I think it's much more useful for people to not get lost in thinking about organizations, but instead start by looking inwardly and saying, what do I really need? And to be as truthful and honest about that and as best they can to try and unpick what's a true present creative need for them or what's some story from their past that they're still serving. You know, I talk to founders all the time where they're not really in the present thinking about what they want to create. They're actually serving a story about being accepted by their parents that goes all the way back to their childhood but first of all looking inwardly getting clear on what they need but then it's about connection so connecting to what other people need as well and and this is where empathy obviously plays a really key part to understand other people's needs and that desire and that pull to help other people meet their needs and and serving your own needs as well so it's neither you know individual individualistic work as we used to as we used to know it nor is it group centered either it's about individuals and it's about connections between individuals and when you do that i think actually work becomes a lot more straightforward you don't get into so much confusing talk about the organization or it being about roles and formal processes you can just get back down to basic conversations about saying what do you need and how can i help how can i help you with that it's actually much simpler much more human and much more much more natural so I try to bring that philosophy into into my own work as much as much as I can, and and that's what's yeah at the heart of the of the Mapteo product as well. Yeah, I think you you mentioned simplicity, and I think that's another really key. Um, maybe that's a key value for you or something because it it comes up uh, a lot in your work. I think, and there's something about um, I think Yoster Block had a great quote about when you when you make it really simple and you give everyone all the information they need it's easy to take responsibility yeah that's that's really true and um you know responsibility is another really key word and um 
I had a real aha moment when a colleague um, said to me once, said, oh, responsibility is only something that can be taken. It's not something that can be given. And there's a really big difference between, between the two. And if you, if you think someone's responsible for something because you think you've given them responsibility for it, there's a good chance they won't be responsible and that thing might not actually happen. But it's very different when somebody says, no, I've got this. It needs a need for me to do this. I've got uh, uh, an idea of how I'm going to do it and I'm up for it. And that's taking responsibility. And then you find that that thing does actually, does actually happen. And when people connect in that way, so they make sure that people are only working on things that meet, meet a need for them. And they make sure that if they're helping somebody else to do something, that they know what that person's need is. You find that the need for formal organization is greatly reduced. And I, my suspicion is that perhaps part of the reason why many people find things like halacracy very overbearing and that there are just way too many rules is it's almost working against this very natural way of working and just asking people what they need because it's almost lost up in the clouds thinking about the organization and how best do I serve the organization when you think well, what, what even are we talking about when we talk about the organization um, so I tend to just prefer a mental model where I just think about the organization just as like it's it's just a story it's not a thing that really exists um, but actually the thing to keep coming back to is individuals and their needs but then connecting to individuals as to other individuals as well um, and then just providing help where it's needed and asking for help where you need help and work just flows a lot more simply like that I think. To come back to that responsibility point because it's something that uh, comes up a lot uh, when I'm speaking to people uh, in organizations who are experimenting with self-management and, and, and other ways of organizing is a common frustration, particularly with founders, where they say to me, you know, I've I've tried to, um, you know, create a flat organization and everything, but I'm really struggling with people taking responsibility. Like some people just don't seem to want to take responsibility. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we put you know, said to everyone, you know, do what things you're interested in. And then they always ends up being this sort of pile of tasks that aren't as appealing and attractive and no one seems to want to do them. And then, you know, founders often then tell me that they at a certain point, you know, particularly if the shit hits the fan, then they tend to sort of swoop in and default back to kind of command and control. Yeah. And I know you also have that really great analogy that I share often with people about, you know, when you say, oh, it's everyone's responsibility to take the bins out. Um, and lo and behold, you find that that no one takes the bins out. So then, what do you do? So how yeah. do you how do you what's the you know in your experience how do you create uh, a culture or what do you do as a leader in particular to create that sense of um, responsibility? Because you as you said, you can't you give responsibility; it has to be taken. But how do how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you one useful little little tip. Um, and that is that you can, it's a very crude way of, of, of categorizing people inside organizations like, like companies. And um, some people within a, within a company will be on their own creative journey in life. So they've got some sense of what they're trying to create, what their life is really, is really about, some kind of direction that they're going in. And those people see that working for the company could be a good environment for them to, to be really creative because they can see the organization has got, it's got resources, it's got colleagues, it's a great place for them, for them to be. And with, with people like that, those are the people that do tend to really step up well to take, to take responsibility for things. They'll say, oh, I can, I can connect to the overall vision here. And I'll take responsibility for, for part of that. I've got an idea for an, an initiative that I will run here. Um, and then the second category of people are more like what you could just call employees. And, and employees, and there's no judgment at all against the skill or intelligence of these people, but they're people who aren't particularly on their own creative journey in life. And when you talk to them about why they work where they work, they will often say, I really enjoy the work. I love the people that I work with and the salary, the monthly salary is really useful to me. And that's completely valid. And those people can do great work, but often those people um, aren't the ones to hold a creative vision within the, organ within the organization. They're the ones that can feel a bit overwhelmed and lost with that. 
And the, the trick is to not treat one group of people like the other, because if you say to somebody who is on their own creative journey in life, ah, oh, tell me about your personal sense of purpose in life, and they'll happily have a conversation with you for an hour about all of their thoughts and ideas around that. But you say to someone who's more like an employee, what's your purpose in life? And they'll probably just feel a bit overwhelmed and embarrassed that they don't know what the answer is. And it's a trap that lots of very creative, purposeful founders fall into because they're on there very much on a creative journey. They assume that everyone is. And they, you'll often see them do things like putting the whole company through a discover your purpose process. And then what you find is that there's a large group of people who just don't really know. And that should be OK and they shouldn't be pressured. Um, but people who fall more into that employee category, what usually works best for them is just really good delegation. So just being clear about the results that are required from them, but let them give them the autonomy to find their way of actually achieving that objective. But don't expect them to be the one to, to set the overall creative direction for their area. So not treating one group like the other. And likewise, if you treat a really creative person like an employee and just try and delegate things to them by objectives, they'll get bored and they'll, and they'll leave and they'll start their own thing or go somewhere else. So that, that sort of broad categorization can partly um, resolve, that, resolve that tension. But also a big part of it is just often in very self-managing organizations, it's just unclear who's responsible for what. And that's one of the, the, the real needs we're trying to meet with Maptio is that you have a map of all of these concentric circles that show the smaller ideas that contributed to the bigger ideas. And then you look for the natural author of each of those. Um, and what we've been finding through companies that are using this is just by having that clarity and seeing people's name against everything, people already start to take more responsibility just because it's in the map. So no, through no formal accountability or um, organizational mechanism, but just by having the clarity, um, people take more responsibility. Or what happens is people see that they're responsible for something and, and realize that they don't actually want it anymore. And then that tells you that that initiative should probably be closed um, or it should be handed over to someone who does want to do it. And maybe what, what you've observed in some of these organizations that you spoke of, Lisa, is that Maybe they've got a whole bunch of ghost ships running inside the organization where it's not connected to someone's real need. They're kind of ideas that sounded okay, but not things that people have really wanted to commit to and take responsibility for. Um, and so probably a lot of those initiatives just need to be killed to free up the time and resources for more worthwhile things. Yeah, it sort of strikes me as... Um it's almost like a coaching mindset like you know in the beginning of a coaching conversation it's always really important to establish what the goal of the conversation is and that's a bit like what you're talking about by establishing what people need and if it meets a need for them to be working on a particular initiative or in a particular organization so it's it's really like a much more um adult to adult taking responsibility for uh, your situation kind of way of thinking about work in a way. Yeah, exactly. And there's another really simple exercise you, you can do, which I used to enjoy doing with colleagues in my last company, where you just get them to make a list of everything that they're working on, everything that they're doing, and put it into two columns, stuff that is energizing them and stuff that's de-energizing them, or stuff that feels like they're paddling upstream or stuff that they feels like they're paddling downstream. And, uh, and that's, that's a very easy exercise for people to perform. They know immediately which things fit into which column. And then when you look at the stuff that's de-energizing to people, you've, you've then got a list of all of the things where they'll be underperforming, they'll be behind schedule, things aren't happening, or where you start to feel there's more of a need for kind of formal accountability practices to just get them to just deliver on that thing. Whereas you'll find the thing is that in the energizing column will just naturally be happening of their own accord because they're energized. Um, by it but the mistake so many companies make is they just think we need more systems and processes to make people more accountable for things that they don't really want to do um, and actually they're approaching it from the wrong end whereas if they get people doing things that are more energizing to them then things that fit into that de-energizing column get passed off to someone else or you just accept that it's not happening anyway so why don't we just remove it from your list and absolve you of the guilt that you're feeling every day mm -hmm. by not by not doing it properly um, and then free your headspace up for something else and that's a much more productive way to work I think. 
Yeah, and I think it's a myth in uh, self-organizing companies as well sometimes that because you're self-managing uh, or self-organizing, it means that everyone has to do everything, particularly if you're you know, like a small mm. team or small startup. Um, and I've heard lots of stories of people who've discovered that, oh, actually, you know, that person is a developer and they're really not interested in governance and, you know, yeah. the, the vision and strategy of the company. They just they love coding and they want to just do that. Um, or, you know, assuming that that everyone has to do everything. And uh, it's kind of like that the polar uh, the polarities, right? It's either like, you know, command and control. You're told exactly what, what you have to do and you just have to do it, like it or lump it. Um, yeah. or everyone does everything but actually there's a kind of there's so many different um, alternatives in the middle as well and I think it starts with having an honest conversation about well what are you energized by um, yeah. and if there's you know things that need to be done in the organization that someone or, or no you know or no one's energized by then then you have a conversation about that and you decide what to do but you do it in a transparent way yeah I mean 100 percent agree agree with all of that and there are so many people great people working inside organizations where they keep getting pushed when they don't need to be pushed they're, they're doing absolutely fantastic work their colleagues really love working with them but there's somehow this pressure to say no you have to be more purposeful in your work and you have to link your work to your own personal sense of um, vision um, and they don't really need that it's kind of like just leave them alone if they if they're a brilliant developer and they just want to develop great software every day it doesn't even matter if they don't get up every day feeling motivated by whatever the high level purpose of the, co the company or the founders is providing they feel energized about the work to help realize the, the vision. And with people like that, the best thing to do is just give them a really clear brief to work from and then say, put all of your talents and skills and energy into helping realize that brief. And if they feel energized to do that, then they'll do a great job and just kind of leave them alone. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I don't have any more questions, but I'm aware that you're such a fountain of knowledge and kind of thoughtful uh, insights on these things. Is there anything else that you think uh, that you'd really like to share with, with people, maybe a, a kind of trap that you see a lot of people fall into when, when they're, experimenting with new ways of working or um, a tip or an insight that you think could really really make the difference for people yeah I mean just to, to sum up everything that we've we've spoken to you know I'd really you know I really sort of channel my colleague um, Charlie Davis around this is to start with needs it's the it's the needs conversation and so don't start by thinking about the organization Start by looking inwardly and saying, what do I really need? Start by asking people around you, what is it that they really need? And, 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 be, and try and get down to the real authentic truth of that. And if that's the thing that you're working from is meeting your own needs and collaborating with other people to help them meet their needs and finding the common ground, then that's the starting point for everything else. Um, so that would probably be my, my parting shot. <laughs> 